Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Sports Marketing. I apologize about the extreme delay in getting this content out to you. Um, this chapter was, uh, well, I geek out, on, geek out on it, a little hard to sift through and a little hard to get through. So I tried to condense it down as much as possible and try to, as far as an assignment, do something that would be easy for you guys to do, recognizing that this is just an elective but at the same time, making sure you understood some of the key concepts from the chapter. Um, so there you go. Now, moving to uh, some other conversations. We are going to show you the only assignment that you have this week is a chapter 14 review assignment. It is a quiz format. Um, it's a review of concepts in the chapter 14, both in text and those covered in lecture. Uh, you will see coming out shortly as well, some chapter 15 and 16 material. It's gonna be very condensed, very simple because it's mostly in cap, this sort of capstone wrap up conversation that um, is not, uh, oh, sorry. There you go. Uh, that is not, uh, we've sort of done along the way. So don't expect to spend a lot of time in that. If you have particular things within those chapters that you want to talk about or expand upon, by all means, let me know. Um, I'm also willing to listen if you guys have any particular area of sports marketing that we haven't talked about yet. Um, let me know as well and I can try to touch on that or even try to bring in someone to come talk. Oh, uh, for a class period and drop an extra day of, of class content in. Uh, so I will email that out as well. Um, sorry, I'm running a note to myself. So, uh, but anyway, that's what you got for this assignment this week. Uh, it should be like, again, fairly straightforward, easy. Uh, and then I will be emailing you out more about chapter 15, 16 plus review and finals week. Um, disregard the, the, I've hidden that week specifically because it's, um, the final is gonna be online. It's gonna be non-comprehensive. Uh, there will be some essay questions, but just as an FYI, there you go. All right, so, I got some material down here that I'm sorts of business journals that I'm looking at. Uh, the interesting news: Apple T Apple TV and the Pac-12 discussing uh, media rights deal for the Pac-12 to move exclusively to the Apple TV. Pretty much being dead panned around the industry is the worst decision the Pac-12 has ever made. Uh, I, you know, somewhat supported by data. Uh, in a article in Sports Business Journal about reaching Gen Z, you know they talk about how television has re reached uh, primarily two thirds of Generation Z watch television to consume their sport content, with o just over a third watching on a streaming platform. I think after the Corona Mageddon, I think you're going to see that dynamic change a little bit because I think people have obviously, as you've seen, the number of subscriptions to all these different online streaming services have soared through the roof but i digress we can't predict that um, i think it would be a different it would set the pac-12 out apart from its competitors so we'll see what happens with that um who knows <laughs> all right so an article from january uh I don't know if I, I think I've shared this with you guys or not. Please let me know if I've repeated this. I, so that way I can be indefinitely embarrassed, about, definitely embarrassed about it. But what resonated with uh, fans among the MLS sponsors? Several brands saw a dip in percentage of fans who can identify them as the official league partner. Uh, it goes through and talks about, you know, the main highlights. Uh, Home Depot saw a 3% increase in recognition. Uh, so, which is good because they are the official sponsor and at a 45 to 21 uh, percent clip over Lowe's. Uh, Audi, which is the official auto sponsor, it uh, saw a 3% dip 
in their recognition. Uh, still significantly, still decently above uh, Toyota at 18% recognition. Etad Airways, and this is something I didn't even know, is the official airline of the MLS. Never even heard of them. Uh, they are currently second to American Airlines with a 18% to 15% uh, recognition. The, I should back up, this is through Turnkey Intelligence, which is a benchmarking service that we, when we talked about the sponsorship and those third-party data providers, Turnkey is one of those. And so this is their survey results based on a three-year average. Uh, so to back up, to explain to you where I'm pulling these numbers out of my butt. Anyway, the other uh, one, another sponsor that had significant movement in the 2018 survey was Wells Fargo as the official bank. They, uh, they saw their percentage dip. Um, so they're 27 to 23%, uh, almost in a dead heat with Bank of America. Uh, if I'm, so if I'm the MLS sponsorship person, and I'm really going to be worried about my conversations with Tad and Wells Fargo, because obviously the sponsorship issues, there are some issues there in those relationships, and we need to work on how to expand and improve them. Uh, as far as Home Depot and Audi, hey, it's going pretty well, so can't complain. Anyway, next little tidbit. Last chapter, we talked about, uh, let's see, I can hopefully I can just pull backwards in this and get, I think I should be able to do it, hold on. The Chase Center. So for those of you who are NBA fans, you will recognize that as the new home of the Golden State Warriors. Uh, it's also located down in Mission Bay, which is right down the street from the San Francisco Giants uh, facility. Cost $1.6 billion to build, has an 18,000 plus seat capacity. It's LED space and the video board, 9,699 square feet. Largest in the NBA. It'll host over 200 events a year, but more importantly, it has 10,000 square feet of shopping space. We talked about in the last chapter, sizzle and steak. Definitely has the sizzle to go with the steak. 1.6 billion, again, but I think it's fairly interesting. Um, 2 billion already in contractually obligated revenue. 300 to 400 million as far as the estimated naming rights for Chase. 2.25 million is the annual cost of the courtside lounges. And 350000 obviously, is the annual cost for the theater boxes. We talked about in previous chapters uh, the idea that when you're setting price ticket prices, you do it in coordination with the market you're in. Obviously, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, major West Coast city, there's the money here to support these numbers. You try to do that in Seattle, probably not going to fly. So it'll be very interesting to see once the new NHL arena opens up, how things compare and in relation to this and where, what the sizzle and steak is there. So found it a little interesting little discussion. Okay. All right, and we already talked about um, Apple TV. So I'm gonna move that, remove that, close that. All right, so next up, we are going to get moving on the lecture. Uh, so here we go. Oh, maybe not yet. Yeah. All right, there we go. Okay.
Hold on, sorry. Making sure I did this right. All right. All right. So here you go. Sign outside the London Olympics or around the London Olympic venues. Official sponsor of the largest athletic event in London this year. There you go. We said it. London Friends, that is. Paddy Power. Paddy Power is an online uh, Irish betting site. Very known for very, very much for their cheeky ads. If you Google them, you'll see what I mean. Uh, the London Olympic uh, Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games ordered this removed as a violation of special legislation passed by the British Parliament, but later backtracked when the Paddy Power pushed back in the lead up to the Games. Legal? Not legal. What do you think? You know, obviously trying to connect itself with the Olympics. You know, first event, egg and spoon at 2.30 but obviously no Olympic logos on it, no Olympic colors, no British colors. Is it legal, is it not? Well, technically, yes, it's legal. Intellectual property law not only is complex, but also as seen in many areas and discussed in this chapter often in flux. In cases ranging from the MBA versus Motorola to Keller versus EA Sports, the rapid advancements in technology have significantly altered the legal landscape. As new technologies emerge, questions like what constitutes an athlete's persona will continue to raise legal issues. Additionally, some commentators have expressed concern that trademark law has been too broadly extended beyond its primary purpose to prevent consumer confusion. As sport marketers seek to protect their own creativity and to avoid infringement, infringing on the creativity of others, they would do well to have a basic understanding of copyright, trademark, and patent law, as well as the torts of invasion of privacy and the right of publicity. When complex legal issues confront sport marketers, a good rule of thumb is to rely on legal counsel that has specific expertise to handle in this situation. I'm not trying to teach you to become a sports law lawyer, but I am trying to give you some weapons to understand when you need to call one. All right, the, con the objectives of this chapter introduce the key legal concepts and issues that affect marketing of the sport product to inform sport marketers about the need, of, uh, the need and methods used to protect intellectual property associated with the creation of sport product or event or with the ideas developed out of sport sponsorship and licensing programs and to examine the legal limits of sports marketing and promotion so a sport marketer can better manage risks and avoid legal liability. Importance of sport marketing law relative to sports marketing. Well, without knowledge of work knowledge of how the law affects sport marketing, professionals in the field could risk considerable legal consequences. It's good to know when you're going into something what your potential minefield is and how to look into and navigate and avoid it. Law is complex and sport marketers often require assistance from trained lawyers to navigate issues, but having a basic understanding of key issues is helpful. Unforced errors don't need to do them. Uh, that's why most major college, major pro, pro teams have inside legal counsel. Colleges all have inside legal counsel as well. And typically, you know, they know marketing departments and development departments know when they need to call those them in. The primary goal of intellectual property law is to reward innovation, invention, ingenuity, and creativity in an effort to maintain an open and competitive marketplace. It is made up of three areas, trademark, copyright, and patent. And each, next to each of those, I put the, lo the little logo that you would see in the uh, store online to indicate what, you know, so you understand when you're looking at that, what you're looking at now. Licensing, we've talked about this a little bit already, but a trademark, copyright, or patent owner may grant permission for its use to others for a fee. When others do not have permission or license rights to use copyright, trademark, or patent, that person is said to be infringing on the rights of the intellectual property owner. Now, what is a trademark? Well, a trademark is a word, name, or symbol 
word, name, symbol, or device used by a person, generally a manufacturer or merchant, to identify and distinguish its goods from those manufactured and sold by others and, it, and to indicate the source of the goods. Trademarks often serve five purposes, identify the source of origin, protect the consumer from confusion or deception, designate a, consist, a consistent level of quality, represent goodwill on the owner's products or services, substantially signify a substantial advertising investment, once, yeah, blah, 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 sorry, backing up, and signify a substantial advertising investment. Trademark protection, trademarks are often, are protected on the national level by the Federal Trademark Act of 1946, commonly referred to as the Lanham Act. Types of trademarks, there are three that you need to sort of be familiar with as a marketer. Trade dress, product packaging. That's talking about, you know, what physically goes into the product. You know, how do you package that product? You know, if you notice when you buy Gatorade, Gatorade comes in a certain bottle. When you buy Coke, it comes in a certain bottle. When you buy Pepsi, it comes in a certain bottle. That's the trade dress. Uniforms are uh, for college teams can also be considered trade dress as well. Service mark, uh, service versus tangible product and collective mark, players, associations, and leagues. Some ex example service mark uh, is the final four. This is the logo from what would have been this year's final four in Atlanta. You can't go out and buy a Final Four, but when I say it, you automatically know what it is. That when, when you think of a service mark, that's that definition, I guess, to simplify it. And the collective mark, when you're a member of an organ, a professional or membership organization, you're allowed to use that collective mark. Well, there you go. NFL Players Association. Member of the NFL, you can have that or use that, obviously, within the rules of the association. To gain national, uh, to gain national trademark protection under the Lanham Act, a trademark must be registered. Again, must be registered with the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. Registered mark gains. Uh, registered mark gain the following: the ability to, of the trademark owner to sue in federal court, and the ability to obtain the trademark registration in foreign countries. Not finished with that list, but also it is not required, however, to establish ownership. It is made, you can, if you were to go to court, even if you haven't filed the trademark, it is not required to establish ownership, but it does give you the following. Again, the two that I listed here, as well as these, the opportunity to file for a trademark uh, with a custom U.S. Customs Service to prevent importation of infringing foreign goods. We all talk about knockoffs made in other countries. There you go. Acknowledgement and protection of the goodwill of the trademark holder and the provision of public notice throughout the nation of trademark ownership, thus creating an easier burden of proof in trademark infringement lawsuits. Ownership of a trademark generally requires the holder to appropriate the mark and use it for commercial purposes. However, since 88, it has been a lot, it has, the rules have allowed people to register marks if the applicant can establish a bona fide intention to use a trademark within a reasonable period. So it's not necessarily something that you need to do. You can do it in the lead up to launching a product, not necessarily once the product is already out on the market. Trademarks can last indefinitely as long as the trademark owner continues to use the trademark in commerce. Types of trademarks, fanciful, distinctive. This is the uh, Richmond Flying Squirrels minor league baseball team. Arbitrary, common term associated with the entity, the American uh, Arena Football League. That is, it can be a trademark term. Suggestive, connotes something about the product. Surprisingly enough, Nike is a suggestive trademark term. Uh, the Greek goddess who was the personification of victory. I mean, it, that's within, in connection with Nike, the term in connection with the swoosh. 
The more distinctive the mark is, the more likely it is it'll be considered a federal registration and thus afforded a protection. The trademark office will also refuse to grant protection as well. Descriptive commonly, you know, descriptive trademarks, commonly used words or phrases that is difficult, is difficult to trademark, although not impossible to do. Uh, the one I love as far as an example using for this class is this little goodie out of the Columbus Dispatch. Ohio State seeks to trademark on the or university merchandise. Ohio State University wants to trademark the word the when used in conjunction with the university's name on its marketed items for, uh, for sale. The university submitted a trademark application August 8th to the United States Patent and Trademark Office in Washington. This was rejected because you can't trademark the but I found it very interesting. Um, they also had a couple of examples. Uh, see if this loads. Uh, they had trademarked. Um, the shoe. The block O. Which is distinctive to Ohio State. And then obviously the logo treatment as well. But they've also uh, trademarked Woody Hayes and Urban Meyer and their likenesses in connection with their program, uh, which is legal to do. And, you know, smart work on the par part of their marketing department to make sure those were in order to protect and maximize their revenue. All right. No protection. When will your trademark not be granted or uh, can be challenged, I guess. When its proposed trademark possesses immoral, deceptive, or scandalous matter, disparages or falsely suggests a connection with persons dead or alive, beliefs, institutions, or national symbols, possesses any insignia of the United States, municipality, or foreign nation, and consists with of a name, portrait, or signature of any living person without their consent, or consists of the name, portrait, or signature of a deceased president during the life of his widow without her consent or merely, or is merely a surname. So interesting limits there, specifically around the president. I found that very interesting, but uh, we'll talk about some of that um, later, but I think specifically a great example to bring up that we've mentioned before is Washington Redskins. That name technically has been found to be uh, disparaging or slanderous. Well, in the 90s, Redskins challenged that and won that there was no proof that every Indian Amer Native American Indian in the country agreed with that. Now, would that have meant that they would have you know, lost the trademark? Yes, they would have lost the trademark. Would that have meant that the Redskins had to change their name? No. They could still use it. All it does is it, and all it does is it protects them from having other people produce their material. That's all a trademark does. So if they lost the trademark, then people could produce Washington Redskin material, whatever, and the ancillary revenue for the team would go down. Would that lead to them changing? Yes, probably. But you know, sort of an interesting little side note in that discussion that we've had before. Secondary meaning. Over the, one of the most hotly contested areas in sport litigation over the past few years is focused on whether color schemes of colleges and professional teams are subject to trademark protection. There are some great examples in the book that talk about this, specifically Seattle Seahawks actually uh, in, it doesn't say what year, but talked about how they went after a, um, t-shirt manufacturer where their t-shirts were football style jerseys in the Seahawks colors without Seahawks logo. Uh, the court held that this color scheme in the football jersey had acquired a secondary meeting entitling the Seahawks to control that. You know, the other great one example from the book is the Board of Supervisors of LSU versus Smack Apparel. Court ruled in favor of the school for the t-shirt slogans and the colors. It supported how smack, however, on a majority of the shirts that while using team colors included non-laudatory phrases and imagery that were deemed to fall into, they were deemed to fall into the category of parody, highly protected by the First Amendment. 
Uh, another example of secondary meaning that was not successful was Alabama trying to trademark the crimson and white uniform combo. Court found the trade dress since the uni, it was not trade dress since the uniforms of Alabama didn't include the team name or logo. So you can see how, you know, so again, it's legally blurry where you've had the uh, court rule that yes, there can be some limit to the use of team colors and logos in connection with the other things going on with the team. But at the same time, if it doesn't have the team logo on it or it doesn't have the school name on it, then it's not protected. Trademark infringement, reproduction, counterfeiting, or imitating a registered mark in an attempt to sell or advertise goods or services that are likely to cause confusion or deceive without the consent of the trademark holder. Again, likely to cause confusion is a big uh, number in, a big note in there, I would say. Would that something to remember? Trademark, uh, traditional trademark infu uh, infringement, confusion, or mistake, or used to deceive, false destination of origin, or dilution are a couple of the um, sort of the three main areas that you can sue under or they can go after you for. Now, determining whether your trademark is infringed upon, a great example of sort of what this looks like in the conversation that goes into the court. Um, I would just, if you get out your book and open to page 403, it walks through the example, sort of through this chapter, they use this example of Jill B. Fan and sort of her ideas on how to basically ambush market this, her favorite team, the Aces. And this goes through her example of in the court answer, asking the same questions. So I'll just read through these briefly. Uh, so you get an idea of sort of connecting what the words on the, the PowerPoint to what we're talking about in the book. The strength of the ACES trademark is the straight is the ACES trademark fanciful, arbitrary, suggestive, descriptive with secondary meaning or generic. The degree of similarity between the ACES trademark and Jill B. Fan's alleged infringing trademark. The similarity of the products involved, the market channels involved. Do the ACEs offer their product to a group of consumers and is similar to which Jill B. Fan seeks to target? The distribution channels involved. Do, does the ACEs sell their product in the same places as Jill B. Fan offers? The intent of the defendant. Does the evidence show that Jill B. Fan is trying to confuse consumers? Believe that she's affiliated with the ACEs? The sophistication of the potential consumer or buyers Buying consumers for specific, uh, sophisticated enough to understand that the ACEs are not the source of Jill B. Fan's product. And the evidence of actual confusion. Can ACEs provide evidence typically through consumer surveys that the consumers are confused about the source of Jill B. Fan's product? There is um, a great discussion. And I think we'll get to that here in a bit. So we'll move on. Trademark infringement. Claims under which the trademark owners can sue. Again, like we've talked about earlier, false destination of origin and dilution. False destination is likely to cause confusion or derived as to the affiliation, connection, or association of such person with another person as to the origin, sponsorship, or approval of his or her goods, services, or commercial activities by another person. So basically, you don't, it's like we talked about with Jill B. Fan, you know, evidence of actual confusion. Is this, and like we've talked about, Bo, you know, is, the, is there intentionality behind the confusion? Uh, the dilution is the third potential claim uh, of a famous trademark, uh, is for, or the third potential claim for the dilution of a famous trademark is known as blurring or tarnishment, basically where the defendant's use of an identical or similar mark or trade name impairs the distinctiveness of the plaintiff's famous mark. Uh, two examples in the book they talked about, Adidas and University of Texas. 
uh, Adidas and Payless Shoes, and then University of Texas in a local um, electric uh, electric company. Uh, the, electric, the electric company proved that through surveys that the mark was not nationally well known. Texas's mark, so therefore they were able to. The court found that Texas's mark was in more of a niche. Uh, logo and market so therefore it was not really a national brand so it allowed the use of the longhorn logo by that electric company found that interesting be interesting to see how that would change now um so obviously again the age of the book compared to what's going on now be interesting to see when they update it uh sort of the case law then uh, additional protection issues, cyber squatting and the Madrid Protocol, uh, international trademark registration. Uh, cyber squatting, the idea that individuals registered domains solely for the purpose of trying to sell the name back to the rightful trademark owner. This, I remember when I first came out of school, was an issue. People were buying web domains as people, as companies were moving to online and online stores and then selling them back to the companies for an exorbitant markup rate. Well, that wasn't necessarily finally congress stepped in and said no we're not going to allow that to happen we need to sort of rectify the situation here and they did uh international trademark registration in the u.s is a member of the madrid protocol which means you file one application with the u.s patent and trademark office the uspto and then you are registered and protected both nationally and internationally copywriting Copyright law and sport marketing. Copyrights can protect written works, music, pictures, graphics, pictures or graphic designs, and audiovisual works, including broadcasts of sporting events. Copyright Act of the 1976 protects original works of authorship appearing in any tangible medium or expression. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act provides copyright law regarding digital creations and the internet. So it's sort of a build on what the copyright law of the Copyright Act of 76. Copywriting an idea, however, is not allowed. Uh, a company tried to sue Nike for the idea of an all-star basketball game. No, sorry, th that doesn't work. Copyright law and sport marketing. A copyright can be for something that will be developed later, similar to a trademark, but the work must be something that can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated. Again, type of uh, works that are protected literary works musical works dramatic works and pantomimes cho uh, choreogra uh, choreogra choreography 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 yes pictorial graphic and scriptural works motion pictures and other audiovisual works sound recordings and architectural again you know you go back to what they were talking about with uh communicated other you know reproduced perceived or otherwise communicated you, know, you can see that here with sound recording, motion pictures, pictorial, graphic, or script, or sculptural works. You can perceive it in your sense, you know, your five senses. So, uh, something to keep in mind there. Um, hold on, actually. Uh, copyright protection, how it begins at the time the work originates and is fixed in a tangible form. So, you can file for the copyright, but the protection actually kicks in. If I were to write a book and once the book is done and the book is published and it is distributed, then the copyright goes in, that protection begins. Once you register it, you can sue immediately for infringement. However, if it is not registered before the alleged infringement, the amount of recoverable damages is limited. Basically meaning that, you know what? If you self-publish, if I were to self-publish this and have not cop filed the appropriate paperwork in with the uh, tr U.S. Trademark and Patent Office, I can't, and I found that, you know, it's cost me, you know, people have ripped off my work to the tune of $500,000. Well, when I go to court, when did the copyright get filed? Well, if they can prove that 300 of that $500,000 ripoff happened before the copyright was filed, then I'm only covered past the date of that copyright being filed. That, that, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it is also important to remember, especially as you go out into the career world, that 
when you work for someone and you produce something for them, anything that you produce in your employed capacity, you do not own the copyright for. Your, your boss and that company does. So if you leave work, you can't take that with you. Copyright infringement occurs when someone makes an authorized use of a copyrighted work. Courts consider four factors when determine whether a copyright infringement has occurred. The purpose of the use, including whether it was for a commercial or nonprofit edu or educational purposes, the character of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use on the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. Translation going one through four, you know, was it fair use? It was in part of the fair use doctrine. We'll talk about that in a second. The nature of the copyrighted work, you know, is it video tech, you know, and how it's being, how it is disseminated the amount of substantiality of the portion of used in relation to the copyright of the work as a whole, and the effect of the use on the potential market for the value of the copyrighted work. There are defenses to copyright infringement, specifically the fair use doctrine. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship and research are all ways that you get sort of can get around it. Uh, there is a great example in the book talking about Muhammad Ali and some clips of his fight. The court found that it was a documentary, and although clearly commercial, it was a combination. The court supported that it was a documentary because it was a combination of criticism, scholarship, and research. Clips had little to no influence on the overall product and would not seriously detract from the market value of the copyrighted fights. All right, copyrights and sporting events. The reason they uh, broadcast cable television transmissions of sporting events are fully protected by copyright law, but the events, games, and statistics themselves are not necessarily covered. The reason they're not necessarily covered, no authorship. Who, who produces, a, you know, who, how does the game come to be? Well, the two teams play. Well, that's not one person. The court determined that Congress intended to protect the league's interest as far as uh, when it comes to this, only in recorded broadcast games, choosing a, a distinctive trademark, establishing a long-term contracts with participants and prohibiting sponsors from cheap, uh, creating or sponsoring similar competitive events can further protect the event ideas. Again, so the periphery, you're talking about the substantive stuff, the distinctive name and et cetera that we talked about earlier in this discussion doing that can protect the actual event but you can't actually protect the event itself patents may be granted uh, patents this is the area of sports marketing that you will deal with the absolute least you will not uh, have much to do with this as a sports marketer patents may be granted to anyone who events or discovers any new or useful process machine manufacturer or composition of matter or any new or useful improvement. The patent cannot be granted for a mere idea, only for the actual invention or a complete description of it. A patent lasts for 20 years. After the patent runs out, anyone can use the technology or make the product. You think about a uh, patent for an uh, example would be um, Velcro. That was patented. And so after 20 years, the patent lapsed. People could rip off and use Velcro all they you know, wanted. Um, you know, the same with, uh, you know, you can think of any other product that's been in use uh, through the years. It eventually, it inevitably started out as a patent, patented product, but after 20 years when the patent lapsed, then it can be knocked off and used by other companies. Sport marketing communications. You must be aware as a sport marketer that a commercial communication uh, in the form of advertising can be restricted by federal law. Specifically, commercial speech must concern lawful activity and not be misleading. The state must have a substantial interest in the restriction of the speech. 
regulation must be directly advanced, must directly advance the state interests and there must be no more extensive, the regulation must be no more extensive than necessary to meet the state's interests. Basically, the government purpose or objective or of the rule regulation that prohibits the speech must be sufficiently important to allow it to limit your First Amendment rights. And the restrictions must be directly connected to achieving the stated objective. It can't just be, well, because this may lead to, it's no, we have proof that this does. You know, I think that the, you look at a lot of things that have gone on on Facebook and social media. It's a very stick, you know, it's a very, and what you can say and do, you can say and do a lot unless it's proof, you know, and proven that you have malice of forethought and it's malicious and it's, you know, again, to put it in that context as well, it's sort of the same barrel of fish in the cup in many ways. Now, as to whether or not it's commercial versus non commercial, we'll result in the court looking at the following Who is the speaker? What is the intended audience? And what is the content of the message? Ambush marketing, my favorite subject, which I'm sure you probably are tired of hearing me talk about, occurs when a company capitalizes on the goodwill of an event by using tactics to imply an official association or sponsorship with this, that sport event. The larger and more popular event is, the more often ambush marketing arises. Well, uh, sport marketers and researchers alike have varying views on the appropriateness and ethics of ambush marketing. Everyone has their own take on it. Typically, ambush marketing in sport takes one of the following forms in order to get around some of the rules. Use of generic phrases, you know, New York City Marathon, race through the boroughs. Purchase of advertising time within the event, uh, event broadcast, present in and around the event venue, conducting consumer promotions. You think about all everything that goes on around the Super Bowl, you're seeing everyone running Super Bowl ads and specials. Well, how many of them are actually official partners offering congratulatory messages? Uh, There's some other examples that I, were great from the book. The US Olympic Committee has sued trying to halt a, an event called the Redneck Olympics. Uh, the NFL actually requires a clean zone and, uh, around the Super Bowl host venue. That means when you go into a site, uh, if you go out, I mean, anything that is, I think it's within a couple mile radius of that stadium, is going to reflect the official sponsors of the NFL. It's the same way with the NCAA. I've given you guys an example in class at least once before of you know Coke being the official sponsor. And then like if you notice how in post-game conferences of last year's March Madness, only Dasani water, you know, only Dasani water bottles on the table. I have been at regional events where they have had to tape over or cover other sponsors and advertisers because they are not official NCAA sponsors and you need to cover them up because that is it's not allowed by the rules but these rules generic phrases purchase advertising within the event broadcast present in and around the event venue conducting consumer promotions and offering congratulatory messages are allowed great example what do you notice okay um, I don't know which baseball, I think this is the new uh, Miami baseball park, I think. No, this is Texas. But, oh, hold on. For those of you who didn't pick it up, let us... Right here, Sanford Health. Now, why would they put this big logo on the side of the building? Well, let me think. Obviously, exposure to the stadium as well as to the TV cameras. All for free. The right of publicity and the invasion of privacy. Those employed as sport marketers for sports teams, sporting goods manufacturers, or individual athletes need to be aware of the intersection of the right of publicity and the invasion of privacy. A right of privacy protects against intrusion on a person's seclusion, 
the misappropriation of a person's name or likeness, and a reasonable publicity or placing the person in a false light. See people suing for you know invasion of privacy under that a lot specifically. You know, uh, the right of publicity prevents the unauthorized commercial use of a person's name, likeness, or other recognizable aspects of his or her persona. We'll get to that in a bit. Many court cases have related to the sports marketing have arisen based on these concepts, but legal lines continue to be blurry. Uh, there again is a great um, example in the, some great examples in the book. Sorry, I'm catching up to my end over here. Um, Uh, you know, Highland Laboratories versus Topps Chewing Gum, dispute over the right to market trading cards of professional baseball players. Uh, Ulander versus Hendrickson, uh, court enjoined the maker of a table game from using MLB players' names without their consent because the players had a proprietary interest in their names, likenesses, and accomplishments. However, it has, again, where it gets blurry is that the court has said that likenesses etc are not an invasion of privacy is not protected in book newspaper magazine television news show or other news media outlet the courts have also recognized the right of publicity and trademark protection for nicknames uh, cbs has also sued the nfl pa nfl players association for the license to use the player stats that are produced after games Companies don't have, the, however, most companies still do pay or seek to pay that in order to gain the official status. However, in that case, there's that element, but then you look at the PGA Tour, which has obviously a completely different scoring system, much more complicated. They've come up with their own propri proprietary system, which is, let me get those, put all drawings, there we go. Um, proprietary system for, scoring that people do have to pay to access. So important to remember those differences. Again, blurry, complicated, a lot of material being thrown at you, I know. Contractual issues involving consumers. Several contractual legal issues have emerged related to tickets and fans and their purchase of season tickets. Uh, teams suing their own season ticket holders for failure to pay. And season ticket holders suing teams and athletic departments by requiring the purchase of a personal seat license or changing policies about seat location relative to personal location, uh, personal donation level. You know, given the increasing levels of financial commitment involving tickets to sporting events, both sport organizations and fans uh, moved to the courts. Um, teams suing their own season ticket holders for failure to pay when people buy professional season tickets, especially when it's involving a personal seat license when you're buying the right to buy the ticket, they have clauses in there for liquidated, liquidated damages. Even if you don't, even if you sell the tickets and don't, you still are obligated to pay. And teams have done that and utilized that as a way to um, recoup lost potential money, especially at teams with long waiting lists when you know this happens after their typical season, season ticket window. Um, the example obviously of the uh, season ticket holder suit, suit is the example in the book from Pitt, uh, which ended up getting settled out of court and resulted in uh, the season ticket holders basically getting their way, uh, but then ending up, you know, within a time frame having to sort of adjust to what the school needed to do once they moved into the new arena. Ultimately, though, when examining such policies, sport marketers must consider not only legal implications, but the public relation implications. A lot of that could, specifically with the pit example, could have been avoided had they talked to the legal eagles in their department to figure out exactly what they could or couldn't do. And someone would have come back and said, well, with the season tickets, I'm sure if it didn't happen, then someone obviously dropped the ball. You know, we wrote this and we said this, so we're obligated to do that, obviously, without serving proper notice, et cetera. Um, 
avoided a large black eye. Could have easily done that. And that's where, again, the purpose of this discussion in this chapter is to give you guys the tools that if you are a professional out there, you have the ability to identify these issues when you know you need to bring in someone uh, sooner rather than later. Some other sort of extraneous little bits and pieces, uh, promotion law issues. Uh, sweepstake contests and lotteries are popular uh, promotional tactics. To use them legally, however, sport marketers must be aware of certain market regulations, specifically uh, the elements of prize, chance, and consideration. Sweepstakes and instant lotteries are heavily regulated by the federal, uh, the state level gaming commissions. And so you have to be aware of that, that you can only you have to register when you to actually conduct a, law, a, a raffle as well as any type of lottery. But when you edit the prize, chance, and, and consideration of that event or of that act of that activity, then you can work around it. Sweepstakes and instant win are popular, but you must promote that no purchase is necessary. Uh, skill competitions, you see that at a lot of sporting events now as well, where participants, you know, that is allowable because the participant's skill or effort governs the results. As well, courts have found as well that a pick a winner contest where you go in and you know you can on I know it used to be a thing on on Yahoo where you could go in and pick uh, fantasy sports. I did it in college. You can pick winners of bowl games and bet money if you want or win money or not. But that doesn't rise to the legal threshold of gambling because it's not there's your it's out of the um it doesn't get there it just doesn't get there i don't know exactly why but again why the legal line is blurry um, some emerging issues that are faced in sports marketing uh, in 2012 nike became the first company to have a twitter campaign banned because of the use of soccer uh, soccer star wayne rooney's private twitter account because it violated their rules stating his tweets were advertisements. Um, the FTC came out with some other guidelines as well. And uh, it's called the Guides Concerning the Use of Endorsements and Testimonials in Advertising. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you and read through the whole thing, but it's at the top of page 422. But basically, the athletes must use use of social media, must use the ad, you know, hashtag ad, and must disclose more about the relationship. And it's outlined in the book um, with that particular sponsor. A lot of this, again, a concern over social media. But if those of you who haven't, I would highly recommend you watching the, everything around the fire Festival, where you had, it was sort of the first case of where social media advertising sort of blew up in a negative way where you had them, the, con the concert promoters, paying influencers to post things. Well, people bought tickets to something that didn't exist. And now as a result, that's why you see ad sponsored comments on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, uh, because that is now required by the FTC and it is a, you know, it is a legal action that must happen. Um, athletes trademarking names and slogans. Uh, I thought I would show you this little tidbit as well. Ah, no. Um, let's see uh, if I can. Uh, All right, I'm gonna do this real quickly, but like uh, we've all heard of T-bowing. Well, there you go. You can see all the patents uh, and excuse me, trademarks around T-bowing and the different, if you click on them, you can see, you know, uh, standard character mark. Um, it's now abandoned, obviously, because he's not playing professional football anymore. But insulated sleeve holder, beverage cups, sleeve holder bottles, insulated sleeve holders for beverage cans. You know, the different ways that it's protected and the trademarks around it for the different uses. So you can see then T-Bowing is not the only one. I'd encourage you to go 
in and look up and see what you can find. It's very interesting. It's also not only with slogans and nick uh, names, but um, different logos as well. Um, it's a very, you know, U United States Patent and Trademark Office, very interesting little um, uh, resource. All right. All right, so the last issue um, I want to read is one of the most hotly contested legal issues facing marketers of college sports and the NCA and the manufacturers of sport video games has been the use of likenesses of current and former student athletes, most notably in EA sports video games, which the athletes have alleged, which the athletes have alleged is a violation of their right to, right to publicity. These games now are no longer manufactured because after the publication of this book, uh, EA Sports settled a suit with this guy right here. Um, let's see, this guy, let me see here. Ah. This guy right here. Oops. Okay, go back. There we go. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right, this guy right here, Sam Keller, former quarterback at Arizona State in Nebraska, sued EA and the NCA that his right of publicity and the right of student athletes, it was a class action lawsuit, which means you know he was filing on behalf of, were violated. He joined in a uh, suit followed by, filed by Ed O'Bannon, a former UCLA basketball player who tried to get the NCA labeled a uh, monopoly. That suit specifically, O'Bannon's was thrown out, but Keller's was upheld. And as a result, EA Sports agreed to pay $40 million to sell the lawsuit. Uh, it's now, and again, it allowed, and it led to them dropping these suite of games from their gaming uh, library. And so it's very interesting to uh, see now looking back at it. And I'm sure many of you out there who have video game platforms have probably never even played any of these. And that, again, has shown the evolution of this element in sports marketing, but now opens the door to what will go on from here, and that is the paying of athletes and how that has started. And uh, we are just even broaching that subject and we'll see what happens. A lot will be coming on that. Uh, and a lot changing in the next couple of years. And so even, I hope, as I assume, I will be continuing to teach this class hopefully over the next couple of years here at St. Martin's. Um, that at the question will change and what it'll look like and the impact even on St. Martin's student athletes. So with that, that is it. So I have given you everything I possibly can give you on sport law. I hope you didn't fall asleep. But thanks again for uh, hanging with me. Um, I look forward to being in contact with you about review next week uh, in the final. And again, hope you all are doing well and look forward to chatting with you soon, hopefully in person over Zoom. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.